right, well, let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 35, 35th chapter in the book of Genesis. And you remember that um, chapter 34, wow, right? I mean, that, that gave us uh, one of the most pathetic pictures out of the history of Israel there is. You remember you had Levi, and you remember you had Simeon there, and, and uh, these guys went into Shechem and sought to avenge the, the rape of their sister, and, and in so doing just created a, a horrific act of, of, of really mass murder. And, and then the rest of the boys, you know, the rest of Jacob's boys joined in and looted the place and pillaged the place. And, and so what you had was mass murder and theft, and again, these are the 12 patriarchs. I mean, these are the 12 fathers of Israel. Now, uh, one of the things I, I think that we would do well to mention as well uh, um, concerning chapter 34 is that the inclusion of that story even, I think, speaks to the credibility of the scriptures. Now, think of all the people groups throughout history and all the, the legends that have been passed down over time. And, and you know, who is going to pass down such a legend of dishonor, right? And yet that's what the Bible does over and over and over again, never seeking really uh, to paint Israel, God's chosen people, as, as anything other than a people that really need their God. Now, uh, the other interesting thing I think about chapter 34 is really the stark contrast between chapter 34 and chapter 35. You remember that the name of God was not mentioned once in chapter 34. And here now coming to chapter 35, we're going to discover uh, the name of God mentioned over 10 times. Now, uh, Warren Wearsby, a great Bible teacher, he calls moving from chapter 34 to chapter 35 like moving from a desert to a garden or, or from a an emergency room to a, a wedding reception that, that where you had death and darkness and despair uh, in chapter 34. Here now in 35, you have light and life and liberty. And what we've begun to discover and, and really will continue to discover is that it is simply obedience. Obedience to the will and to the word of God that really determines which of these two environments that we discover ourselves in. You remember God had called Jacob to go to Bethel and, and Jacob knew that and he did not do it. Went somewhere else and the result was, was great dysfunction and, and, and great darkness within his family for a period of time. Now, uh, here in chapter 35, J Jacob is going to lead his family back into the will of God and the result is going to be a great cleansing and a, and, and a great restoring within uh, these people. Now, uh, again, Genesis being the book of beginnings, we see uh, a lot of firsts here. Uh, I think one could say of chapter 35 that we have here recorded uh, really the first revival in the scriptures. Now, uh, we have to be very careful with this term. I think that um, what most of us envision when we hear this term, there's a, a mental image of, of some kind of an emotional gathering or meeting where, where there's just a great emotional outpouring. Maybe you've got crying. Maybe you've got a, a very charismatic speaker in some kind of large outdoor tent or, or whatever. But, you know, people are being emotionally touched and, and moved upon somehow. I, that's what my guess is most of us picture. But what we're going to discover here in Genesis chapter 35 is that is not exactly the kind of revival that has come upon the camp of Jacob here at this time. So let's dig in and get after it tonight. Let's see what the word of God has to say about what we might call biblical or authentic revival. Picking it up here in verse 1 of chapter 35. Then God said to Jacob, arise and go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So there's God on the scene. Now, I told you last week, I, I believe um, there's a, a gap here. Now, now, how long of a gap that we have between chapter uh, 34 and 35, we don't know. We're just not told. But what we'll discover in a bit here is that these guys um, are going to Israel, will do away with a number of idols that they've accumulated. 
Uh, no doubt these idols, these false gods, were somehow assimilated into the camp of Jacob uh, over time as a result of, of absorbing the wealth and the people of Shechem. Uh, there are scholars that suggest maybe two or three decades have passed here. Uh, and again, you remember back in chapter 34, not only did they walk away with all of their goods, uh, but they also took the women and the children in Shechem. And, and one of the things that we'll discover uh, really throughout the history of Israel in the Old Testament is that any time these guys absorb, if you will, these other people groups, bad news is usually not too far around the corner, all right? Uh, the Bible has a term for this. We typically call this the the mixed multitude, and, and there are a number of times we see this in the scriptures. We see it here. Um, we see it in the exodus uh, from Egypt. We see it in the return from Babylonian captivity a bit later. And so Israel teaches us a valuable lesson in their proclivity to adapt to the ways of the world. That, that though we are, and it's the Great Commission, Though we are to reach out with, to the, the lost world with the gospel, though we're to reach out with the gospel and to befriend of the unbeliever and really minister to them, we have to be very careful in that, in the course of doing that, we're not drawn into the ways of the world. You remember Jesus said in his high priestly prayer um, to the Father in John 17, he said, I have sent them into the world, but they are not what? of the world. And of course, Paul tells us in Romans, look, be careful not to conform yourself to the patterns of this world. And so Israel really teaches us throughout the Old Testament, we've got to be careful there. And again, we're going to discover here in a minute, not only did they pick up the women and children of Shechem, but they picked up a number of false gods again as well. Now, um, we are assuming that these are Years, or these were, rather, years of silence between chapter 34 and chapter 35. Again, not one mention of the Lord in chapter 34. But now, and this is always very interesting to me, now God just shows up on the scene out of nowhere in verse 1, and he begins to speak to Jacob once again. Now this lets us know that when revival takes place, that revival is not something that can be scheduled, now, from time to time, you'll have, you know, churches planning a, a spring revival or a fall camp meeting or what have you. And, and, of course, there is nothing wrong with that at all. I think it is a very good thing to uh, desire a time of gathering and, and getting serious about um, renewal with the Lord. You know, a, a lady once asked Billy Sunday, uh, the famous evangelist, uh, she once asked him, well, why do you keep organizing revivals when it doesn't last? To which he responded, why do you keep taking baths? You know, and so again, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but as far as God truly moving in the hearts and, in, of, of men and women and children, it's not something that we can really schedule. What we discover in the scriptures is that revival seems to take place on God's schedule. That it is entirely God's doing and there's nothing that we can do to really hurry God up if you will or slow him down I, I shared this with our prayer team a couple of weeks ago there was a a man by the name of Evan Roberts and uh, he is uh, the, the uh, um, man who historians point to as the spark that really ignited the Welsh revival where over a hundred thousand people were brought to a saving knowledge of, of Jesus Christ at the turn of the 20th century. Now, this guy, this guy prayed for, for 11 solid years for God to move upon the hearts of the Welsh people. Now, now 11, 11 years of prayer. Why 11 years? I mean, you would think one solid year of prayer, that ought to do it, right? What about three Five, seven, you know, nine, why 11? And we don't really know. As Paul said in Romans chapter 11, quoting Isaiah, who has known the mind of the Lord and who can be his counselor? God is operating with perfect eternal information. We, we know very little about. He has irons in the fire. We know nothing about. And at the end of the day, this side of the resurrection, we just don't know why God does what he does when he does it. And so here, God is showing up 
We know his timing is always perfect, and God now begins to move in the camp of Jacob once again. All right, well then what does he do? Let's look at verse two. So uh, Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves and change, very emphatic term in the Hebrew, change your garments uh, and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar, underline altar there. There's a desire to worship anytime we see the word altar. I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So uh, they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears. Nothing new under the sun, right, Solomon? Uh, And Jacob hid them, now mark this very carefully, hid them under the oak tree which was near Shechem. So he had them hide these false idols at the base of a very strong tree tree. A a, a wonderful detail. We'll get to that. Now, we're able to discover here two things about authentic revival. That number one, there is a sensitivity to sin. And that number two, uh, so number one, there's a sensitivity to sin. You know, there's a recognition of sin that's in a person's life. And number two, secondly, there is a willingness to turn away from that sin. And so in an authentic revival, you know, it doesn't have much to do with, well, let's all get together and get real excited, all right, or, or in certain charismatic circles, you know, let's get together and, you know, the Toronto blessing, don't know if you ever heard of that, you know, let's get together and, and uh, laugh uncontrollably and roll over the floor and bark like dogs and, and, you know, these kinds of fruits of emotionalism, these things have happened, all right, but when there is a true revival, listen now, When there is a true revival that has been produced by the Spirit of God, there is a real sensitivity to sin, and there is a willingness to turn from that sin. In other words, in a revival brought forth by the Spirit of God, you are going to see a real move towards an emphasis upon personal holiness. All right? Personal holiness. Holiness. Again, the word of God says God is holy. And if we are saying, if we are asserting that God is coming alive in our midst, then one of the fruits of that should be the holiness of the Lord being seen in the lives of his people. You know, in Ireland, back in the 1920s, uh, there was uh, what came to be known as the Ulster Revival, where there was just this huge move of God among the shipbuilders and and the shipbuilders were so moved of God that that they began in droves. I mean, they just began returning uh, stolen tools that they had had stolen over a great number of years. They actually had to build new warehouses for all these stolen tools that these shipbuilders were bringing back. Now, that's sort of what we've got going on here in chapter 35 within the camp of Israel. Jacob is saying, all right, I, I want you guys to bring all of these stupid idols, all of these false gods, and man, we need to get rid of them. Now, you might remember Rachel had stolen her father Laban's idols back in chapter 31. And of course, with the absorption of the mixed multitude from Shechem, Jacob no doubt became aware that there was a great number of false gods hidden among the caps. So guys, these got to go. And so verse 4 there, uh, the people comply, right? Willingness to turn. The people comply, and so they go and, uh, you know, give Jacob, all their ACDC and Black Sabbath albums and so forth, you're right? You know, so, so they, there's a, that sensitivity to sin, and then they return the false gods. Now, here's what I want you to notice. Where did they put them? End of verse 4, under a strong tree. An oak tree is a very, the, the, the idea there is a very strong tree, all right? Now, Bible students, some of you know that, that oftentimes in the scriptures, the cross is called, referred to as the tree. Blessed is he who was cursed upon upon a tree, both Old and New Testaments. Uh, one of the images we see of the cross is a tree. So here they are, bringing all their false gods, burying them under the tree, and the idea is, even as you and I are, to take those things that hinder us and bury them at the foot of the tree, the cross. Okay, so there's a beautiful picture there that the Holy Spirit is there furnishing. Now, also notice here that Jacob tells these guys, all right, 
I want you to change your clothes. Second part of verse 2 there. Purify yourselves, change your garments. And the picture here really reminds us of, of the imagery we, we also see in much of the New Testament, right? Where Paul tells the Colossians and the Ephesians and the Romans, you know, hey, the idea is put off the old man, put off the old self, turn off the old cell phone, and then put on the new man and, and put on the new person. And, 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 you know, clothe yourselves in the righteousness of Christ. And, and so the idea of, you, you like what I did with that? All right. And, and so the idea of clothing and garments, the idea of clothing and garments in the scriptures speaks really to a new beginning and a real turning within a a, a person's heart. And so there is a sensitivity, a biblical revival. There is a sensitivity to sin, a willingness here on the part of the people to put away their sin. And then, of course, notice what that then produces. You've got the mention of the altar, altar there. And so the idea, again, the putting away of sin ushers in a real desire uh, to begin to worship the Lord once again. Well, notice what else is produced, picking it up in verse 5. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Now, again, remember, everything that Jacob is afraid of never comes to pass. You remember how afraid he was that they were going to wipe him out. Well, that doesn't happen. So a great terror comes upon the cities. They did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Verse 6, so Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there, and he called the place El Bethel. Now, this is a nice detail, all right? So there are times when you and I have associated in our lives certain places that that we attribute spirituality to. We do this with a lot of our churches, all right? Uh, but, but we have to remember it's not what? It's not the place that it's important, right? But the God of that place. And so here the Holy Spirit includes this detail. It's not Bethel, but he, he, he names this place El Bethel, which means the God of Bethel. So it's not Bethel we're to get excited about. It's not our churches necessarily, those buildings that we're to to get excited about, but the God of Bethel and the God of wherever it is that you choose to fellowship. So El Bethel, uh, verse 7, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. All right, well, again, we've sort of seen this theme recur the past couple of times together, so do you suspect the Lord's trying to tell us something here? Again, 90% of the things that you and I worry about, the majority of the things that cause our hearts to be captured by fear, never really come to pass. Again, you remember Jacob upon learning of the destructions that his sons brought upon the men of Shechem, that, that his heart became gripped by fear. And, and verses uh, 30 there in, in chapter 34, and he was just afraid the rest of the Canaanites were going to see that and come and wipe him out. And yet here we discover that returning to the Lord, walking now in obedience, the Lord now shelters them, protects them. We read in verse 5 that there was a great terror that came upon the cities around the camp and so they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Now, again, the majority of the things that we fear do not come to pass for the child of God. And so we'll keep bringing this up till we get it. Again, John tells us in 1 John 4 that the perfect love of God does what? It casts away fear that as you and I grow in God and give ourselves to the word and come to know him, as we, we come to, to just appropriate through that relationship, you know, that, that love and that trust and that, that protection and that provision that comes with knowing God, well then, one of the things that should be produced there is, is an absence of fear. All right, in our hearts. And so, man, we need to get that. We need to receive that. God's trying to tell us something here. Man, walk in that freedom. Now, here's the application in this context. Listen up. One of the arguments that we often put forth when we, in this context of revival, right, one of the arguments that we often put forth when we feel a particular conviction coming upon us from the Lord, one of the excuses that we tend to manufacture is is that we think that the bringing forth of that thing that we're being convicted about, we think if we bring forth that obedience, some frightful consequence is going to be associated with it, right? Hey, man, I'm a little worried that if I go through with this deal, you know, I might be harmed in some way. I might lose that job or 
or I, I, I might lose or sever that friendship or, you know, so I'm just not going to step out here. And yet notice that God supernaturally protects these people. Understand, friends, that when you take that step of obedience, when God brings forth that conviction and you walk in that and you take that step of obedience in God's direction, that God's protection is going to be there and that God's blessing is going to be there. So walking in obedience really places you and I under that umbrella of of God's protection. And, And I need you to see that now. Does that then mean that walking in obedience somehow insulates us from heartache? When we step out in obedience, we will be protected, all right? But does that somehow mean that if we, if we step out in obedience, we'll somehow be insulated from heartache? Notice verse 8. Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. And she was buried below Bethel, Bethel under the, I think that's the third different way I've pronounced that, Uh, Buried below Bethel under the oak, it was named Alon Bakuth, which means oak of weeping in the Hebrew. Now, now this had to be an emotional blow for Jacob, all right? This Deborah here, she was uh, uh, the maid or the nurse for his mother. And of course, we know that Jacob was very close to his mother. There was this great relationship there. You remember Jacob was her favorite and and daddy favored Esau. But, you know, they, they had this wonderful relationship, mom and Jacob. Now, of course, mom has passed away. And it's evident that Jacob has taken this nurse under his wing and and she's a part of the family. In fact, we can see that in Genesis 24. So you might imagine, given the love that he had for his mother, that no doubt Jacob and Deborah had spent a good deal deal of time together just talking about mom and and reminiscing about mom. She's part of the family. and, And now all of a sudden, here is a dear one that's been taken from him. Now, perhaps the thought had crossed Jacob's mind as it often does ours, right? Come on, God. I mean, I obeyed you. I ran your program. And now you know this person that I love and care about has passed away. So again, what we're being shown here is that just because we take steps of obedience, although yes, we ourselves will be prepared, protected that does not necessarily mean that while we men you know everything's now going to turn up roses in fact we are not doing uh, brothers and sisters a favor when we push that okay Uh, obedience does not necessarily mean that we will be insulated from every form of heartache in our lives but notice something else here notice the great thing that does come with obedience picking it up in verse 9 you get God. Verse 9, then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram and he blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. You remember he said this before after the wrestling match. Here's a repeat of the promise. Uh, Thus he called him Israel. Verse 11, God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you, and I will give uh, give the land to your descendants after you. Verse 13, then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Now, uh, here he takes a step of obedience. And what happens? Now God comes to him again. If you have not discovered it yet, I pray you have. If you haven't, listen up, man. Obedience always seems to open up that door to to fresh revelation and and a fresh encounter with the Lord. And and our Christian experience, man, it just bears this out, that that when we wander away from the Lord, when we start living in chapter 34, where there's no mention of God, well, it just seems like, you know, the heavens are brass and, and God is silent. But somehow by grace, God just breaks through that hardness in our hearts and and he reveals to us what it is we need to do to get right with him once again and so uh, then we take that step of obedience and, and lo and behold there's that that fresh revelation and that fresh encounter with God once again and and as parents we get this in a sense right 
You know, your children kind of wander, uh, swerve off the path and, and wander into willful disobedience. Well, there's a real stress there that's brought to bear in that relationship. And, and the same thing can be said of, of the relationship between ourselves um, and our heavenly father. And so, so the Lord comes now and he appears to Jacob once again. Now, also notice, mark it well. This is huge to me, all right? Uh, that the Lord here reminds him, if you're a note taker, write down reminds or remembrance. Mark it well here that the Lord reminds him again of all the blessings that he has. And I've mentioned this quote quite a bit from C.S. Lewis. Reminder is the mother of learning, right? And so here now the Lord takes him back to the basic promise that he had made to him the very first time that he had met with him at Bethel. Now, this reminding, right? This is something that we have studied God doing over and over and over again with the patriarchs, right? That you had God appear to Abraham. He lays out the covenant. I'm going to bless you and your descendants. They shall multiply as the stars in the sand and you're going to be blessed. And and then a, a chapter later, there's that promise again. It's just rolled out again. A chapter later, there's the covenant again. You get to the next patriarch, Isaac. He rolls out the promise. Another chapter, he rolls out the promise again. It just over and over and over again. And then with Jacob, over and over and over again throughout the scriptures, God reminds these patriarchs, these men of God, of all the blessings that they have. All right? Now, God seems, God seems in this to somehow get the frailty here and the, the forgetfulness here. You know, Psalm 103.14, a verse I'm eternally grateful for, that God knows our frame and he is mindful that we are but dust, all right? In other words, listen, God understands. It is in the Bible. There is a verse on it specifically. God understands the faulty machinery that you and I are working with, all right? And so, so friends, it is very important that we remind ourselves with great regularity just how good God has been to us. It's like this. There's two kinds of old people, all right? We had some fun with this yesterday. Um, but, but, you know, what you'll notice about old people is that, that on the one hand, <clears throat> all kinds of filters going on here, but, but, you know, on the one hand, there's that old person that is just a delight to be around, right? Right? I mean, they're just, they've got great stories and these cute little phrases that, that just tickle you and all the, the stories. And it's just a delight to have in your life. And then you've got the other kind of personality where they're just, you know, the, the grouchy old geezer. All right? I mean, they're cranky and raspy and bitter. And, blah, 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 and they're just shriveled up on prunes. And, and you just don't want anything to do with them at all. Now, it has been my observation that really the difference between those two types of people is the awareness of the blessing of God in their lives. That one goes into old age and just realizing how blessed they have been and and man, I'm so blessed by God and God has been so good to me and then the other just goes through life, well, I've been robbed and, and, you know, I've been ripped off and everybody owes me and nobody's paid, Right? And so reminding ourselves how good God has been to us can really be the difference in setting ourselves upon the path to joy or in the absence of that, we can discover ourselves really on the path of of developing just a real corrosive nature and and, and a real bitter uh, spirit in life. And so um, God comes to Jacob and reminds him, son, you have been blessed and you are going to be blessed. I, I think it is of tremendous practical spiritual value for all of us to meditate um, often on how much that God has blessed us with. And I will offer forth a challenge before we leave tonight on that. All right, well, picking it up in verse 16, and this is interesting. We move now from the voice of God. We move now from the voice of God to the voice of a baby's cry and and really a mother's last words and and just another difficult pill uh, to swallow here for Jacob, verse 16. Uh, Then they journeyed from Bethel and when uh, there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and she suffered severe labor. 
When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Ben-Onai, but his father called him Ben-Yamin, or Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Eprath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Uh, Now, uh, here again, friends, we're we're able to see that God does not insulate those who walk in obedience from heartache. And here now, man, this was the love of his life. You remember, this was a woman he worked 14 years of hard labor for, and now here she is taken away as well. And so Rachel dies giving birth to Benjamin, and of course, from Benjamin is going to come the first king of Israel. We know, of course, that the apostle Paul was a Benjamite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, this boy right here. And so, man, just just a rough ride here uh, for Jacob. And of course, that that is, um, you know, this side of the resurrection, just what life is. It's just this mosaic of lights and shadows and of of great joy and just you know deep sorrow and 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 this baby here brings great joy but but also uh, along with that tears now um in this though in this we see a fantastic foreshadowing of jesus christ get with me notice first of all where all of this goes down verse 16 underline eprath there uh, Ephrath there and of course this is what will become known as Bethlehem you know the verse Micah 5 2 O uh, Bethlehem Ephrata Ephrath though you are small among the people of Judah uh, and so forth out of you will come forth the Messiah um, so this happens on the way to Bethlehem here which is the birthplace of Christ now this crowd knows this probably don't have to remind you but we know that what the Hebrews named their children after the circumstances surrounding their birth now notice mom calls him Ben Onai, which means in the Hebrew, son of my sorrow. Okay? And of course, dad says, nope, not going to call him that. That could get rough for the kid in junior high. And so Jacob calls him a Ben Yamin or Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So mom calls him son of my sorrow. Dad calls him son of my right hand. Now, you remember Mary. There she is in Luke chapter 2. She had given birth to Christ by immaculate conception, of course. And there Simeon comes along and he prophesies and he says, you know, this child will reveal the deep thoughts of many. But then he turns to Mary and says, and and to you a sword shall pierce your very soul. All right? And of course Mary, we know she would see her son mocked, made fun of, rejected. and, And just imagine what had gone through Um, her mother's heart seeing her son beaten to within an inch of his life and hanging on a Roman cross. I mean, I don't think we could, could wrap our mind around that. And so Jesus was to Mary the son of sorrow. But to his heavenly father, he is referred to over and over again in the scriptures as the son of my right hand. And so here, in in what amounts to be Bethlehem, the birthplace of Christ, we have a fantastic foreshadowing of really um, the dual nature of the incarnation. And and once again, Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. And and when we get together next time in, in chapter 37, and really for the rest of the book, in Joseph, we will see one of the most fantastic pictures of Christ in really all of the scriptures. All right. So a great uh, foreshadowing of the dual nature there of the incarnation. Now, speaking of dual natures then, notice verse 21. I find this interesting. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched in. That's talking about Jacob. Okay, not the, the nation that's coming forth, but this is the man. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. You know, it's interesting how, how this man's name just is, is beginning now after this wrestling match to go back and forth from Jacob to Israel and Israel to Jacob. And you remember <clears throat> chapter 32, after he wrestled all night with God, that, that God said, all right, I, now, now you're, you will no longer be called Jacob or supplanter or schemer because he brought him to that place of confession. But now you shall be called Israel, which means God rules, all right? Now, what is interesting 
is that following the man now, how often in this chapter alone, I mean, his name's going back and forth. Verse 9, he's Jacob. Verse 10, he's Israel. Verse 20, he's Jacob. Verse 21, he's Israel. You know, he's Jacob, he's Israel, he's Israel, he's Jacob. And, and is that not sort of really like us? Right? That we have these dual competing natures within us? That there is that Jacob nature, that that part of ourselves that seeks after our own desires as we sort of lapse into the flesh from time to time. And then there's that Israel part of us, if you will, where we're, you know, really pursuing the things of God. And and of course, the Apostle Paul would pick up on this theme quite a bit in, in Galatians and Romans. And he talks about, you know, the flesh nature being at odds with the spirit and and how these uh, strive against one another, that our flesh strives against the spirit and so forth. Recognize, friends, and this is your memory verse, by the way, on your study guides. We move from glory to glory, being transformed in the image of Christ, right? We move from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18, by first of all, recognizing these two natures within us. We move from glory to glory by first of all recognizing these two natures within us in order that we might yield less and less to the flesh nature and really allow ourselves to be governed more and more by the Spirit of God. Make sense? So part of yielding to the Spirit is really recognizing that we do have this side of the resurrection, these two natures competing within ourselves. All right. Well, finally tonight, uh, one more hiccup here, and then we really, um, from this point forward, begin to move now and transition from the time of Jacob to the time now of Joseph. And it is going to be just a fantastic journey heading into now really this last section in the book of Genesis. This book gets better and better and better <clears throat> as the revelation, as the progressive revelation of God moves forward, and that's by design, all right? Now, uh, let's wrap it up then, beginning in verse 22. Uh, It came about while Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's porcupine, and, oh, wait a minute, Um, I never did like that word. Uh, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Come on, people, get with me here, lighten up. Uh, Now, there were 12 sons of Jacob, Uh, Now, this is really a reiteration of that which has played out um, before us in the last several chapters. Here's a a reiteration listing. Uh, The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simeon and and Levi, uh, the father of Jeans, and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, and the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhah, uh, Rachel's maid, Dan and Naphtali, don't want to name your kid that, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. Uh, These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. And now here we have Isaac passing. Verse 28. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. An old man of ripe age and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. All right. Well, first of all, back up in chapter, um, or verse rather, 22 there. Uh, You know, Reuben goes and does something pretty dumb, pretty immoral as well. Uh, That goes, I I would imagine, without saying. Now, we know he was the firstborn, and there is some thought that maybe he was trying to set up his dominance in that culture to do such a thing, was to sort of declare yourself head of the family. I'm going to lay with my my old father's concubine. You know, I'm the man on on the rung now. And so, and you see that later in the Old Testament with Abner and Absalom. Okay, look at 2 Samuel for that. Uh, But in addition, really, and my point being, in addition to the utter immorality here, this is really an act of rebellion uh, that, that really, really never plays out in, in, in the favor of those who perpetrate it. Now, um, what's interesting to me here is Jacob's silence. And, 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 and notice, the end of verse 22, uh, Jacob's silence, but notice that detail, Israel heard it. And notice we're not using the name Jacob here, but we're using his spiritual name, Israel. 
Okay, so God, sometimes we may think like he is not saying something, but do not be deceived. He has heard it and he knows it. We'll talk about this in a second. Well, we'll talk about it right now. Um, We spoke of this a couple of weeks ago, and I think this is very uh, powerfully in view here, uh, that, that when we sin, and nothing seems to come of it, and and we sort of think we've gotten away with it, and and the fact that we think we've gotten away with it, that that, that can lead us to to sometimes persist in that sin. But the Bible tells us, Numbers 32, 23, right? Be sure your sin will find you out. And that's exactly what's going to go down here with Reuben. Jacob will remember this on his deathbed, and Reuben is going to be robbed of what may have been. He will be deprived of his birthright. And so we need to understand because again, uh, we should look at the frequency with which these things come up in scripture and and give them due attention. We're seeing this come up again that that just because Hebrews 12, 6, God disciplines his children, right? A loving father disciplines his children. We should not think that because we are in some sin and nothing seems to come of it or we don't feel the discipline of God upon that sin, we should not think that we're getting away with it and we should not use that as, as some kind of a, um, an impetus to continue in that sin. God is not mocked. He will not be deceived. Galatians chapter 6, we will reap what we sow. We do not get away with sin, even though we might not see the judgment or the discipline from that in the short term. So, so I think we would be wise to um, understand that. All right, well then to wrap up the chapter, again we had a listing of, of the 12 sons there. Uh, again, a reiteration of what's already played out. And then finally we have the passing of, of Isaac, Jacob's father. And it is interesting, again, we remember Jacob was mom's favorite and daddy favored Esau. And so Jacob, being the ill favorite of his father, if you will, probably wasn't very excited about seeing dad. And, and so there doesn't seem to be any real drama recorded in these verses. He just sort of shows up and buries his dad. Now, chapter 36 here if you've looked at this pretty intimidating, very long list of names, and we're not going to run through this in the interest of time and and content here, but uh, the entire chapter really gives us a dual genealogy of Esau, right? And then Esau sort of drops off the scene as a withered uh, branch, if you will. But this is not to say this is not important. I would encourage you to study this this week, and I'd like to point out a couple of things for those of you that choose to do so. I, I would certainly encourage you to do it. Again, this is a, <clears throat> a very lengthy genealogy of Esau. It's really split into two parts. The first part of the genealogy gives his genealogy within the land, and then his genealogy outside of the land. It's interesting that, that I think it's four out of the five names of the genealogies in Inside the land have something to do with God in their name and then when he goes outside of the land the names of that second genealogy have nothing to do with with God in those names and so we're seeing a picture of just the drifting away of this man from his roots and and really just uh, plundering in, into the flesh and and deception uh, another thing that I think you're going to um, discover here and, and really one of the reasons this is an important genealogy is that Uh, coming forth from Esau will be the Edomites and the Amalekites. Some of you are starting to to remember those names if you know your Bible. Uh, From him will come forth the the Edomites, the Amalekites, and a number number of other splinter groups that will really prove to be a real hassle for Israel going forward. Now, now what um, Esau's descendants give us a picture of, again, keep this in mind as you study this, just giving you a few things to think about. Um, one of the things you'll discover uh, as you go through this is that, that the Esau's descendants give us a picture of the flesh, all right? And, and really a, persi- a picture of the persistent nature of the flesh. You'll come down in here and you'll see these Edomite kings and it'll say, and so this Edomite king rose uh, and lived and he died. And then another king rose in his place, lived and he died. 
And then another king rose, lived, and he died. And you'll just see that repeat over and over from verses 31 down to 39 there. And the picture there is just the persistent nature of the flesh. And and remember, Israel gives us, in, in a very general sense, a picture of the New Testament believer in sort of the meta narrative in the in the bigger picture. Uh, and, and Israel will constantly be dealing with uh, attacks from uh, the Edomites and the Amalekites and so forth, and just very persistent nature of the flesh that is being pictured here. And, and, and you and I, we see this in our lives, that as soon as we get victory over one aspect of the flesh, Boy, it's not too long where another little bugger rises up and raises its head, right? And now we've got this thing to contend with and that thing to contend with. And and so this is a very interesting picture of the persistent nature of the flesh. And, and, And Israel will have to contend with that. That is part of our reality as well. You know, we like to, uh, again, particularly in, in kind of the um, church light in America these days, we like to point at the devil a lot. And, and we've got this, this uh, sort of hyper-intensive spiritual warfare theology. And, and the devil made me do it. And everything's the devil. And everything's an attack of the devil. And, and we give the devil so much credit. You know why? Because it's easier to point to the devil than our own stinking flesh. And so the flesh is very persistent. Be careful in that. Now, the good news is that through Joseph, the son of the promise, and and really through the valor and the honor of Joseph, through that, one day will come the eternal son of the promise. That, of course, is Jesus Christ, and it is through Jesus Christ that you and I, praise God, have been given the strength and the power um, to, to really have victory over the flesh. And so one of the things I think we ought to be praying about this week is that the Lord would really quicken our hearts to, to seek personal revival in our lives and, and to seek and, and, and pray for authentic revival in our churches, that we would cry out to God to see a move in our midst. Might we pray this week that God would give us a real sensitivity to the sin in our lives and that he would give us a desire to really turn from that sin and turn to him. And of course, I also think it would be very wise, we would do well to deliberately meditate often on all that God has done for us in our lives, all that God has blessed us with, that we might set our hearts on a right path and and, and not a bitter path. And so one of the challenges that I want to give you this week Um, should you choose to accept that, is when you leave here tonight, or maybe not tonight, um, certainly very soon this week, I would challenge you, get out a piece of paper, get out a pen, and simply begin to write out all the things that you are thankful for, all the things that the Lord has blessed you with, and just look at that over and over, and and just allow that uh, to create within your heart just a real tenderness and a real sense of thankfulness and and gratuity um, as you go through this week. And so, friends, as we wrap it up, let's just keep it simple. Two things come screaming out of the text tonight. All right, let us remember this week that it is obedience... And remembrance that the Lord would have us to bring forth in our lives that he might continue to do a real work in our hearts and continue to to make us into the men and women that he desires us to be. Obedience, remembrance of those blessings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for all that you are. We thank you that even when we make poor decisions for ourselves, like we saw the family of Jacob in, in chapter 34. God, we, we thank you that, that you're just there to, to break through by your pure grace into our hard hearts once again and, and just call us back to you. Thank you, God, that you are so gentle and you are so forgiving. You are the God of a thousand chances, not the God of second chance or a third chance, but God, any time we turn you will lovingly open your arms and take us back because you wiped out all of the sin that we've ever committed, are committing, and will commit. So God, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for your son. Thank you that you have washed away our sins and that you just pursue us and invite us to walk into human flourishing and and, and into a abundance that you have designed God that as we bring forth obedience we are we are walking into just 
flourishing and, and, and the very best life that you have for us and, and help us to constantly remember, God, all that you have blessed us with. And we can only do these things, God, by your power and your spirit. Fill us this week that we might bring glory to your name and we ask these things uh, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. All right. <laughs>